Hey everybody, welcome back to Environmental Organic Chemistry with Dr. Lisa. So we're continuing a long series of lectures about sorption. Again, I apologize for the length of this. It's a complicated topic. Um, so this lecture is going to be a lot more practical about how do we actually calculate things based on KOC and what are sort of the characteristics of KOC? How does it change? How can we predict it? So this is a more practical part of the lecture. Um, so one of the important things to remember is that KOC, one of the beautiful things about KOC is that KOC is related to KOW, okay? And that, that gives us a handle on how to predict it because KOW is something we can relatively easily measure for most organic chemicals. And even if we can't measure it, we can, we can predict it. Uh, when we get to the lecture on prediction, you'll be, see that just you can just look at the structure of the chemical and you can predict its KOW value. And from that, you can get a KOC value. So um, <clears throat> KOC is, is related to the absorption coefficient KD, which is CS over CW, and it's normalized to the fraction of organic carbon. And uh, we can use it to calculate the fraction of the chemical that's in the dissolved phase by using this equation, where it's 1 over 1 plus. RSW is the ratio of solids to water. Uh, KOC, FOC is unitless, right? It's just a fraction, so there's no units. Remember we said that KD has units of liters per kilogram, kilogram, and because FOC is unitless, KOC also has units of liters per kilogram. <clears throat> so again, unit, no units here, no units here, liters per kilogram here, and therefore our units on RSW have to be kilograms kilograms per liter, which is tricky because usually if, you know, you measure it, you measure it in units of like milligrams per liter. So you must remember to convert your units because if you forget and you use milligrams per liter here, you're going to get that like all of your chemical is absorbed, or excuse me, all of your chemical is, yeah, all of it, the fraction in the water goes to almost zero. <clears throat> okay. So remember we had this whole conversation about sorption isotherms. And the idea of the sorption isotherm is that it's not linear. You know, if it was just linear, we wouldn't need an isotherm. But the isotherms show curvature and stuff. And so the, what that, the upshot of that was that KD was not constant across, <laughs> there's my husband again, in the middle of my recording, slamming the door. Thank you, honey. Okay, uh, um, so anyway, what was I saying? See, I lost my train of thought and I blame him. Okay. Um, yeah, so KD is not constant across the entire range of concentration. As concentrations get higher, KD can change. And the same thing is true for KOC, okay? But, you know, we have to make some assumptions somewhere and simplify our lives somewhere or else things just start to blow up. So we're going to make some assumptions here about KOC being pretty much constant, and that's okay as long as we're working at low concentrations. Uh, and it turns out that as long as that's true and we're at reasonably low concentrations where like, for example, we don't have a separate phase of our chemical forming because the concentration is so high, it's exceeding the absorption capacity of the soil. So as long as that's not true, then, then KOC is pretty strongly correlated with KOW. So here's an example. Uh, this is some stuff that Carrie Gigliotti did. This was actually in our lab back when it was run by Steve Eisenreich. This is done in the New York, New Jersey Harbor. Um, Back in the 90s, good God, some of you weren't born that, born then, excuse me. I was, I was, came to Rutgers in 99, so I'm old. Anyway, so this is some, some stuff that we did in the, in the New York, New Jersey Harbor. This is uh, KOW, you know, that you just get from looking it up in a book or, or an EpiWin or something. And then the measured KOC for these chemicals on different days. Okay, this days, you know, sometimes the same day, morning and night on the same day. And this is for PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And so Karakov had published this study in 1981 where he argued that the slope of this relationship should be exactly one, that KOC is almost equal to KOW. Maybe there's an intercept, you know, it's slightly off, but the, the slope should be one. And so we're out in Raritan Bay, we're measuring in the slopes 1.15, 1.10, 1.10, 0.945, 0.915. That's pretty close to one. So the relationship between KOC and KOW is usually pretty good. Um, and, you know, this is just one experiment. Many people have shown this in many places at many times. Um, and then here's another experiment. We did kind of the same thing, except that this is for PCBs. And the difference is that PCBs are more hydrophobic. So now we're looking at log KOW between 5 and 8 here. 
and I think on the previous slide we were looking at three to three to six. Okay, so or you know, four to six. Okay, so a little bit more to the left. So these so PAH is a little bit less hydrophobic. You get to PCBs which are quite hydrophobic, uh, and you start to see some different stuff going on. Uh, one of the things you see is that the um, so this is a this is an example of where we took a sample. This is from 1998. And without doing any correction, we measured the KOC or calculated the KOC for these chemicals. See, every once in a while, my pointer goes a little crazy. Hey, okay. Um, yay, pointers. Okay, so we, we measured KOC for these chemicals, or what I would call the apparent KOC, and plotted it versus KOW, and our slope was not one. And we're like, huh, what's going on here? Um, and the answer is, Frequently for these very hydrophobic chemicals with KOWs above five, six, you know, yeah, above six, okay? When you get to that level, they're so hydrophobic that they're sticking to everything and to a great extent. And that means that they're sticking to all the particles, including the particles that are so small that they go through the filter. So when you filter your samples, you know, you're out in the, in the, in the, um, in Raritan Bay, for example, and you're filtering these samples like on board the ship, or, or maybe you filter them as soon as you get back to the lab. But they're, you know, they have a lot of particles in them. So you use, typically you use a 0.7 micron filter. If you use anything smaller than that, anything with a smaller pore size than that, then the filter clogs up every 30 seconds and it's just a pain in the ass and you just, it's just not practical. So a 0.7 micron filter is about as small pore size as you can go and still have this just be practical, be doable. You know, it's possible to, to filter this, these samples. And 0.7 microns is not that small. Uh, if any of you who are microbiologists know that if you want to filter out bacteria, you use a 0.45 micron filter or maybe even a 0.2 micron filter. Uh, so so 0.7 is on the higher side, which means that very small particles do get through that filter. And it doesn't matter so much for PAHs because they're not as hydrophobic, but for PCBs, a significant fraction of some of these big hydrophobic PCBs are sticking to those particles that have gotten through the filter. So you're, you're calculating KOC as CS over CW, but your CW is artificially too high because it's including some stuff that's not really dissolved, it's actually on smart, small particles. So if CS, CW is too high, then KOC is too low. And that has the effect of shifting this whole line downward. Okay, so, but if we could correct for that, which, hey, we can, uh, if we could correct for that, we could calculate, instead of the apparent KOC, we could calculate what we call like a, a corrected KOC or a true KOC, where we collect, correct for the fact that some of our chemical is bonded to what we're going to call the dissolved organic carbon. Dissolved organic carbon just means that it goes through the filter. So we're calling it dissolved. That doesn't mean it's dissolved. It could be very tiny particles, but we're calling it dissolved because it goes through the filter. So if we correct for that and we say, okay, so some of our chemical, you know, we're doing now three phase partitioning, dissolved particle phase and dissolved organic carbon phase. So just like we did a three phase partitioning between water, air and organic carbon or octanol, uh, and when we did our three phase partitioning example, here we're doing three phases, but it's water, particulate organic carbon and dissolved organic carbon. But the math is the same. So instead of having like a KAW times VA, we have KDOC times the amount of DOC here. And that describes the amount of the chemical that's sticking to the dissolved organic carbon. The question is, what's KDOC? Okay, so we can make some assumptions. KDOC, uh, first of all, we assume that KOC was equal to KOW minus 0.21. In other words, the slope here, it isn't specifically stated, but the slope here is 1, 1.0. Okay, we didn't, we didn't specifically write that out, but, but the slope is one and we're assuming there's just an intercept. And for KDOC, we're doing the same thing. We're assuming that the slope is one here, 1 here, 1.0, uh, but the intercept's a little big, bigger, it's minus one. So what we're saying here is that, let's say log KOW is like six, right? That means the log, KODO, log KDOC would be five. So it'd be an order of magnitude less. So we're saying that um, KOC here is a better sorbent for our chemical than KDOC. And we know that from the difference in these two intercepts, because this is a bigger intercept and you're subtracting it off. So if K, KOC, let's say KOW is six, then log, log KOW is six, then log KOC is 5.79, right? But log KDOC is just five, so it's lower. So, so DOC is not as good a sorbent 
as, K, as OC, as regular organic carbon or particulate organic carbon. That makes sense, right? Because for, for the organic carbon to be quote unquote dissolved, it must be fairly polar, right? For stuff to dissolve in water, it's gotta be on the polar side. So it makes sense that, that the more polar it is, the less it's gonna absorb a chemical like PCB, so it's gonna have a lower partition coefficient. Okay, so the point here is that when you do these kinds of experiments, when you're thinking about absorption of very large hydrophobic chemicals, PCBs, dioxins, brominated flame retardants, um, something, you know, big chlorinated pesticides like Myrex and stuff like that, you have to consider this DOC part. And we're gonna talk about that, I think in the next lecture, next little sub lecture on absorption. Um, but the point is it can distort your view of what KOC is if you don't take that into account. So these things that pass through the filter are also sometimes called colloids. Uh, colloid has a specific technical definition. The definition of a colloid is a particle that does not settle out of water. No matter how long you wait, it will never settle. Okay, but never is a long time to wait and we don't have that much time. So we define colloids as anything that passes through the filter. Same thing as DOC, two, two terms for the same thing. And the, these stuff passing through the filter can often be the cause of something called the solids concentration effect, which I'm gonna to get to, not in this slide, but in the very next one. This is just an example of Diane Achman. She was out in Green Bay, which is part of uh, Lake Michigan. Um, and she was doing some of these similar types of things, log KOC versus log KOW. And she's seeing slopes not anywhere close to one, okay? And the interpretation here in this particular case, uh, notice, okay, here's October, October, June, June. Hey, this is my birthday, June 5th. Um, these are times of the year where it's still fairly warm outside and it's fairly sunny. And the phytoplankton is growing gangbusters. It's a nice, warm, sunny day because that's when you go out sampling on Green Bay. You don't go out on the nasty, cold, awful day. Uh, you go out on the nice day. And so the phytoplankton is growing rapidly. So you're creating fresh organic carbon all the time. And ergo, your system is not at equilibrium. So that's why you might get a very low, low slope there. Okay, solids concentration effect. Here's an example of the solids concentration effect. Let's, let's say I do, I'm measuring KOC and I have the comma A here because this is the apparent KOC without any of that adjusting for dissolved organic carbon. Uh, and I plot it versus the amount of particular organic carbon in the water and I notice that KOC goes down as POC goes up. And I'm like, what the F? Because KOC is supposed to be constant, right? This relationship, this significant slope here where KOC goes down as POC goes up is called the solids concentration effect. You might hear it called that. Uh, and this happens to be for brominated flame retardants, BDEs. Um, so these are very large hydrophobic chemicals, log KOW is well above six. And so that's when you're gonna see the solids concentration effect is when you have very large hydrophobic chemicals. And the interpretation here is that when POC is high, D, excuse me, when POC is high, DOC is also high. A lot of POC means a lot of DOC. A lot of DOC means stuff getting through the filter, means that you're artificially reducing KOC because CW is not really CW, it's not dissolved. It includes some stuff on particles. So as soon as you see this, you know it's time to start thinking about correcting for uh, DOC via this method, right, that we talked about here. Okay, um, and so because we've decided that KOC is similar to KOW, we can actually develop some linear free energy relationships and people have done this. Now, of course, it depends on what soil you're talking about. <laughs> You know, different soils are going to have different uh, KOC values, so it's a little tricky there. Um, but yeah, for, for some typical values of KOC using some typical soils, they have done this linear free energy relationship. Slopes are close to one, usually most of the time, okay, occasionally, occasionally quite low, but usually close to one. Uh, and the R squareds are pretty good, occasionally not so great. Uh, but, but the take home message is that if you have a chemical and you go to EpiWin and you try to find its KOC value and you can't find one, then the next thing to do is look up its KOW value and then think about whether there's some way to convert that KOW value into 
KOW and convert it into KOC. And this is just a, a smattering of, of equations that the author of your book was able to find from the literature. Uh, if you go looking deeper and do a literature search, you might find a uh, uh, an equation here that's specific to your type of chemical because maybe your chemical is not, doesn't fall into any one of these, these categories, you know. Maybe it's a nitrobenzene, right? It doesn't fall into any of these categories. But if you go do some literature searching, you might find a good uh, relationship. Okay, one last thing to remember, sort of more of like a caveat. Remember we said that, that absorption isotherms are usually not linear and that there could be curvature here. So here's an example of curvature. This is, which kind of isotherm is this? This would be a Freundlich isotherm this type of curvature. Langmuir is where it's, it, it levels off at one value. And I think of, because the Langmuir looks like that, and that looks like an L on its side. So that's how I remember that that's a Langmuir. Okay, boop, erase. There we go. Okay, so the problem is that KD uh, and therefore KOC are frequently not linear, they curve, okay? And in the world of science, if you want to measure something like KD or KOC, you're going to measure it at fairly high concentrations over here because that's what's easy to measure. You don't want to be down near your detection limit. That's a pain in the ass. So you're going to measure it up here, but in, in your contaminated site, for example, that maybe you're investigating, you may be down here at very low concentrations. And so there's an inherent bias because KOC values and KD values measured in the lab are more likely to be measured at high concentration, which is going to give you a lower value. Remember, KD is proportional to the slope here. Um, so you're going to have a lower measured value and the actual value might be higher. So the measured values are always going to be biased a little bit low. And of course, you always have to remember too that it could be that KOC is not the only thing going on. Remember that in the real world, you might have, for example, black carbon or something else in your system that's an important sorbent. And so for many sediments, we find that a, an equation of this type usually does a pretty good job of describing sorption because you're describing sorption to the organic carbon and to the black carbon. But then the problem is I need an F, or excuse me, not FBC. FBC is easy to measure. You're measuring the fraction of black carbon. I need a KBC. What's the equilibrium constant for sorption to black carbon? Eh. So people have tried to do this. Here's one equation that they've come up with. You know, this is, I'm not saying this is by any means definitive. It's just an example. But people have tried to do this where they've tried to come up with uh, equations to relate KOW to K for black carbon. So you might be able to do that if you can't look up a K specifically for black carbon for your chemical, which let's face it, you probably can't. You might be able to estimate it from KOW as well. All righty. Uh, so just a, oh, we're almost there. I know it's a lot about sorption. I apologize. Uh, we're almost there. Just one or two more lectures about sorption and then you can forget you ever learned it. <laughs>